Monu, Tangaloa, Monu, Tangaloa. I am praising the Lord for his guidance and wisdom for this conference. Johan Sigurdsson, San, Iceland Special Envoy on Ocean Affairs, the distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen. I would like to begin by thanking the um, Arctic Circle Assembly and Conservation International for the opportunity for my delegation to participate in this excellent assembly. It is an honor to be addressed you as a representative of New Air. Our land mass is tiny, less than 3% the size of Iceland. But along with our neighboring countries, we are one of several large ocean states. Our collective exclusive economic zones exceed 23 million square kilometers, an area greater than the EEZ of the USA and Russia combined. We are sea people. We value access to ocean resources very highly. They are our lifeblood. I would like to illustrate this by describing for you the significant contributions that tuna fishing makes to Pacific Island economies, employment opportunities, and food security. Nine Pacific Island countries and territories derive between 10 and 90% of their government revenue from the license fees paid by distant water fleets to fish for tuna in their waters. These distant water fleets come mainly from the USA, Japan, the Re People Republic of China, Chinese Taipei, Korea, and the European Union. Recent analysis by the Pacific Islands Forum Fisheries Agency show that our tuna resources already support around 25,000 local jobs in canneries, on fishing vessels, and in fisheries management. As the Honourable Minister from Fiji has explained, tuna also plays an important role in the nutrition for Pacific Island people and will have to provide much of the fish we need for our food security in the years ahead. It is no surprise, therefore, that we are taking great care to manage the region's tuna resources sustainably. And I am pleased to say we are succeeding. The scientists from the Pacific community responsible for the regional tuna stock assessments confirm that none of the tuna species that occur in our waters and in the broader Western and Central Pacific Ocean Convention area are overfished. To optimize the benefits of tuna resources, our leaders have endorsed a regional roadmap for sustainable Pacific fisheries. This roadmap aims to continue to sustain tuna harvests at recommended levels and value to catches, increase the number of jobs based on tuna, and allocate more tuna for local food security. All fisheries ministers in the region Submit an annual report card on progress towards uh, achieving these goals. However, there is a widespread concern that these well-laid plans could be disrupted by the continued greenhouse gas emissions. We are concerned because we have already learned that climatic variability in the form of the El Nino self and oscillation ENSO has a dramatic effect on the distribution and abundance of tuna in our waters. During El Nino events, when the south um, east trade winds east, tuna are caught most easily in the east of the region. During La Nina episodes, when the trade winds strengthen, the best catches occurs in the west. It gives me great pride to say that the family of Pacific Island countries have cooperated effectively to deal with strong effects of this climatic variability on the distribution of tuna in an equitable way. I will not go into details of the highly successful fisheries management system known as the parties to the Nauru Agreement Vessel Day Scheme here. They will be explained during a breakout session 
on a predicted ocean tomorrow. Disturbingly, this world-leading cooperative fisheries management arrangement is expected to affect significantly by climate change. As you can see from this graphic, based on primary modeling, if business as usual, greenhouse gas emissions continue, the distribution of the abundant skipjack tuna will shift to the east by 2050. As a result, more than 100,000 tons of tuna will no longer be under management exclusively by the Pacific Island countries. This is a potentially an important climate justice issue. Pacific Island economies, which have made negligible contributions to greenhouse gas emissions, will collectively lose control of a significant proportion of their most valuable natural resource. Conversely, fishing fleets from the large development uh, countries that have produced most of the emissions will obtain higher proportion of their tuna catch from high seas areas where they do not have to pay license fees. I am grateful for the opportunity to raise awareness of this situation and to call for negotiations that recognize the dependent of Pacific Island economies on tuna. Negotiations that I hope will culminate in arrangements that will enable Pacific Island economies to retain the present day benefits they receive from tuna, regardless of the effects of climate change or fish distributions. As a region, Pacific Island countries also have work to do to enable these negotiations to proceed effectively. We need to improve the models used to protect the changes in tuna distributions with much great certainty we will then be able to identify the expected changes in abundance of tuna in the waters of the Pacific Island country and engage in negotiations with confidence. One of the weaknesses in the existing tuna climate model is that it assumes that each species of tuna forms a single stock across the entire Pacific Ocean, as shown here in red shading. Recent genetic Studies indicate that this is not the case. Research is now needed to identify the number of separate stocks for each species of tuna and model the response of each stock to climate change. Many of the potential adaptations available to help Pacific Island tuna fisheries adapt to climate change can only be evaluated effectively once this important block of knowledge is in place. This is recognized by our regional partners, the Pacific Community, the Pacific Islands Forum Fisheries Agency, the Secretariat of the Pacific Environment Program, the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations, and Conservation International. They are now working with Pacific Island countries to submit a proposal to Green Climate Fund for a substantial support needed to improve the science underpinning the tuna climate models and to adapt Pacific Island tuna fisheries to climate change. My trip to Iceland this week has also enabled me to recognize another possible adaptation based on applying the principle of adding value to catch practice so successfully by the private sector here in Iceland. Most of the tuna caught from the Pacific goes into cans. Although we appreciate that canned tuna will always be pillar of global fish consumption. What I have learned in Iceland is that diversifying Pacific tuna products is also likely to be a win-win adaptation. Diversification of tuna products should create more profitable supply chains in the short term, providing more employment opportunities in the long term. It also expected to increase the value of tuna license fees. This would assist several Pacific Island countries to maintain present-day license revenue, even though fewer are caught in the waters in the future. Thank you once again for the opportunity to talk to you about profound potential impacts of climate change on tuna resources underpinning the Pacific Island economies. Like the Minister uh, from Fisheries from Fiji, I would like to conclude by underscoring the importance 
all countries, for all countries to work together to limit warming to 1.5 degrees. It is our common interest to implement our national determined contributions in line with the Paris Accord. Kia monwena and God bless.